This is the Real Coaching Podcast. I'm Joel Filio, back with Paulo Souza. Hi, Joel. So, you're not in Kona anymore. I think you're probably the only coach I've ever heard of that leaves Kona before the race starts. What's going on there, Paulo? Uh, what can I say? The work, the work was, uh, the work was done. The, the guys are, uh, are, I was there with, uh, team Wurtel, uh, Heather and Trevor Wurtel. These are, these are guys that are really good at operating on their own and they're extremely professional and extremely dedicated. And, uh, and I feel that I could, uh, I could, uh, add value, uh, by being there and supporting their training during the the doing the hard miles but uh, as as race approaches i think that uh, they're uh, better off just uh, going back to their uh, their procedures that uh, that have been have been with me away from them most of the time and going into races and they've been performing really well this season uh, under those conditions so uh, so i really think that there was the best option to just leave them to their own devices and and obviously, at the same time, uh, race week in Kona is something that I that I don't enjoy uh, personally. Uh, the the whole circus atmosphere is uh, kind of uh, annoying, and uh, so so it's a win win situation for me. It's, it feels like a very real coaching move. Do do focus on the prep, and then and then you don't need to be there uh, race week. Um, yeah, good good on you. So. We were going to talk about the the importance of Kona a little bit. You, you can't help but uh, you, can't, you can't escape it at all now. Um, kind of uh, on the watching what's going down. Everyone's arriving. All the businesses showing up. Um, it really has evolved from kind of more than just a race to to almost like an expo. It's taken over from inner bike that kind of thing. You see bikes released and all the sponsors there. I mean and even the the pressure for athletes to be there. Um you know whether they're whether it's kind of a good competitive move or not for them, you really see the the drive to be there. Um and uh you know, it was almost even taking away from the race to, to some degree, but there is a race going on. Um, and yeah. uh, you talked about how you didn't like the, 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 the kind of the, the vibe race week or the, the atmosphere, the environment race week. But, but talk a little bit more about, um, about the race and, and the importance for, for your athletes and, and the sport in general. Yeah, it's 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 a big race. It's uh it's 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 probably like the biggest one day race in our sport. It's uh it's it's a huge event, but like you mentioned as well, it's uh it's uh it's the annual trade show uh for triathlon and uh and with that there's uh there's a lot of distractions particularly like I I think there's distractions for pretty much every every athlete but uh, but there's a lot of distractions for the for the top athletes that uh, that have uh, solicitations uh from every sponsor that they have they're asking for appearances at the expo um they're asking for more social media content they're asking for photos they're asking for uh panels uh breakfasts uh <laughs> dinners lunches uh so 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 when you're a top uh, a top uh, athlete you have to manage not only having to prepare the the biggest race of your season with um with uh with just like having to uh having to respond to all these solicitations and it's not just it's not just the it's not just sponsors also also fans the the guys the guys that are like the top guys that are easily recognizable um uh, just they go out and uh, and they just get not I wouldn't say mugged but basically basically like people ask them for autographs uh, or not autographs people ask them for selfies and <laughs> and uh, and photos and all that stuff so so it's uh, it's it's very hard to um, to manage all those uh, solicitations and still uh, in still uh, uh, being able to perform and on top of that it's at the end of a long season. It's a long season for most for most of the athletes uh, um, competing. Even if for some, you know, as you know well, there's there's a there's a class of athletes that just uh, 
uh, pretty much like gave up on on racing uh, outside the, the basic requirements to qualify and uh, and they just elect to just perform at uh, one race of the year and and that's something that usually uh, pays well particularly for former champions that they can just uh, once they they win the race the, the 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 only thing that they need to focus on is on winning the race again so basically you see athletes that uh, that are just not racing the whole year or racing the minimum and just focusing, putting all their eggs in into the, the, the corner basket. I mean, that's an interesting one. I, w- I was thinking about that as I was watching this, the build up really. And, you know, how, how different it is than, than many other sports or different, you know, even than, than short course um, where, you know, uh, the ITU series, for example, you see the best, not a- every race, but they do race head to head, more often where where as you said with 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 kona and ironman it, it really seems to have you know consolidated to the one race a year where we see everyone going head to head and a lot of athletes making that sort of decision you know or, uh, whether it's a career decision or or how you come to it but you know put all your your focus on on this one race and if you have a great race it can can be you know quite a good move but on the other hand it's not the right move for everyone but from a sport mm-hmm. point of view, it's kind of a shame that we don't we don't see too many more of, you know, these kind of races. And, and you know, from one point point, of course, it being an ultra endurance event, very long event, you know, you can't have everyone racing, you know, head to head very often. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, we yeah, we get it once a year, so the importance is magnified. Yeah, it's it's like you said, just like all those factors contribute for 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 the race to be the biggest race of the year. And uh, and, you know, one opinion that I have that I, probably is not going to be, you know, well accepted or accepted by many is, is that at the same time that Kona, Kona is the biggest event in our sport. It's, I think that also uh, Kona is uh, is uh, stifling the, you know, the sport as a whole or Ironman as a whole, just because. You know the characteristics of the race uh, being always in the same place in a place that's hard. It's hard to get to get to for pretty much everyone. You know, it's California is close to Hawaii and it's still a it's still a five six hour flight. Uh, so it's a, a race in a location that's going to be very expensive to everyone, pros, age groupers to get to. It. I I think it. Uh, it limits it, it limits the growth ability of the sport to have to have an, a world championship with so many limitations and and for sure you would uh, you would you would mean a lot or or the sport could take a huge step forward if the if the world championships uh, changed venues um, every every year at the same time it's another thing that that keeps that uh, that keeps you know the sport in the same place is is the fact that the prize money for the prize money for kona continues to be to be ridiculous for uh, for an event of of that size uh the winner makes uh, makes $120,000 and uh and uh and the 11th place uh gets gets zero like like I'm sure you 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 know Joel so and and uh and uh, obviously, this is a this is a situation where, where you know, it's hard to convince people that the biggest event of in in the sport is in Hawaii in October, and uh, and the winner gets one hundred twenty thousand dollars. Nobody nobody that's outside the sport is going to be convinced uh, that this is a big event. And um, and I think that uh, that uh, Ironman both for for pros and also for age groupers like the level of the sport as a whole would be greatly enhanced with better prize money at the biggest race and also if the the world championship traveled around the world yeah i mean here here there's a there's so many factors there one of them is like how long has the prize money been at that level even like mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. a long time like i, I want to say 10 years who I, you know don't even remember the last time it changed substantially yes. and then so it's essentially deflating that 
Um, and I mean, we understand that, you know, what incentive does, does WTC to have to increase it? You know, I mean, they, if anything, the importance of Cohen, as we're saying, have just, has just increased for the industry. And, you know, as we were saying in the, in the, the beginning, you know, there's such a push from the sponsors and from the, the industry businesses for the athletes to go, um, even if they're not racing, sometimes they're, you know, they, there's a pressure mm-hmm. to go that, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, it's just such a drive uh, and a, a pivot point for the, for the, for the sport. But at the same time, to- totally agree from a sporting point of view, you know, we, we've, we're losing out on, on a different element by having the, the race in the same place. Um, you know, I've mm-hmm. often thought when we need classics, you know, in, in triathlon, like uh, something that the cycling has, um, that the triathlon doesn't have as much of our races with a long history um, uh-huh. that you can be interested in and excited about and, and we've we've not really had so much of that we, we in the past we, we had we had events like that but you know Kona is probably the, the best example of, of uh-huh. an event with history which is appealing it's appealing to a lot of age groupers it's you know the the mecca of of, of triathlon in some respects However, from a sporting point of view, in exactly, we're missing out on you know the the progression and evolution of, of the sport, and even if you know for people that haven't been or or have, I mean, Kona Kalua Kona is a pretty small place, you know, um, mm-hmm. and and you know we're perhaps missing out on growing the sport by bringing this sort of big show to to other venues that you know that might pay a lot to have this event and pay a lot for the 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 right to host and to have all the age groupers come and you know televisions title sponsors etc that that you know that might be limited by by having that this this yeah. venue year over year and also the conditions you know, for the for the most important by far event, the conditions are very particular, and not uh-huh. not every athlete performs well in in those kind of conditions, the extreme heat and humidity. So you know that's another factor where you get sort of one dimensional kind of athlete, the or, or you have to make yourself into somebody that can perform there. But that's just, that's just not going to be everybody. We're missing other sides of the sport. So yeah, I mean. Uh, you, it, I don't think anyone could make an argument that that Ironman racing, professional Ironman racing, has progressed significantly in the last ten or fifteen years, and and maybe these are some reasons why. Uh huh. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know the event would have like would have so much to gain, so much to gain uh, for, for from if if it just moved around. And one thing that that would gain, for example, just like in size in people watching you know there there's there, there's a problem uh, there's a problem in the US there were like people are not not like really big spectators like you know you go to any triathlon any ironman uh in the US and uh, and the people that are watching the race are usually families and uh and uh and and the race is uh, the race is mostly composed of people that are supporting age groupers uh at at the race and uh, and for example like bringing it outside the u.s would just make a huge difference in people in in like in public coming out and that enhances the the tv product immensely to have people watching because um uh, there's a you know the the race itself as is very is very lonely when the when when the competitors are are out on on the queen k you know it's a very uh, lonely uh desolate place so i think like the sport as a whole would would um would uh would uh benefit tremendously from uh, from seeing the the world championships travel around the world so we're only going to see more of this build up in the next week um uh as we see you know the the, the social media push and, mm-hmm. and as you say so so many uh of the industry businesses there uh uh, really take, taking it. I mean, it reminds me of, sort of you know, Olympic type events where everyone's got to have, you know, there's got to be the Oakley house. There's got to be, you know, the, these you know, business that take over. And, and as we said, that just, just pushes everyone to, um, to make a bigger and bigger show to, in order to stand out from mm-hmm. the noise. Um, so we'll see more of that. And I'm sure we'll be talking about it after what, what happened and who, who blew to pieces and who, who left their best, uh, corner performance, uh, in training prior to even arriving uh, on the island, and uh, and then who plays the race just right to uh, to uh, manage the conditions best and and run run quick across the finish line. Yep. 
So the other race that we wanted to briefly review were Salinas World Cup. So we had one week after the Cozumel uh, Grand Final, which we talked about last time. A uh, good portion of the athletes went on to uh, Ecuador to, to a new race. Um, uh, not the strongest field, but nonetheless pr- pretty good racing uh, by some different athletes that didn't necessarily race quite as well in, in the grand final. So you, you had, uh, we talked about Summer Cook last time, and uh, she was again on the podium. Yes, uh, yes, Joel. I wanted to talk about this race. It was a really important race in the calendar, and uh, and uh, as such, uh, I had two athletes in the podium. So one of the most important races of the year. Uh, <laughs> seriously, uh, ob- obviously, you know, as as you know, these uh, these World Cups uh, uh, in Olympic year after after the Olympics are a tremendous opportunity for development athletes to uh, to. Uh, progress through the rankings and uh and uh and gain experience and all that stuff in in fields that are not as not as loaded or not as competitive and uh and i think that's that's where this salinas world cup uh uh fits in and uh and uh you know it was uh it was uh more or less like a, a competitive continental cup with uh way better money and uh and uh, yeah, I had I had fun watching my athletes uh, uh, perform, and then both both uh, Summer Cook and uh, Matt McElroy uh, ended up being second in their races. It's uh, particularly significant for uh, for Matt, who's uh, who's an uh, ex collegiate runner that uh, that just started swimming uh, two two and a half years ago, and uh, and he's made some uh, tremendous progress and. Uh, and it, it was great to see him uh, race at this uh, at uh, at this decent at uh, at this level, and uh, so that was good. And on top of that, I also I also like some of my athletes beat some of your athletes, so that's always a good a good day when that happens, Joel. <laughs> yeah, I mean it, it, it's good um, good prize money at the at these World Cups. Um, you know, when I saw the the ITU announce seventeen of them next year, I'm interested to see if they keep the the prize money, but. You know, we were just talking about you know the sort of the stagnance of of Kona, but but some of these these kind of more development races in the ITU circuit, um, you know, can be can be quite quite good for athletes to have a chance to race race for some decent money, and you know, certainly pay, a bit easier than th- to make your money back on the trip if, if you're not a funded athlete, for example, and or get some good racing experience. And there's really something to be said about sort of learning how to win races or learning how to you know get in the top eight or or whatever the level of the athlete is but um you made an interesting um point or you talked about matt matt there um who really came from a running background and and just re- recently started swimming properly and i think that's maybe a, a topic for for one of our off-season um podcasts about about swimming again but what are some you know, touch on some of the challenges of taking taking you know somebody with quite a high level of running but but uh not so much experience swimming what, what were the key points you think to to get him across to this level of performance uh it was it was basically obviously and we talked about this before you know uh athletes athletes make make uh, coaches look like genius sometimes you know because and uh or most of the times or all the time and uh, and and that's that's due because you know no no success or no overnight success or surprising success is 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 it possible without uh, without athletes' abilities both in terms of you know talent that they have for the sport but also uh, the ability to work hard and to commit to uh, to a project and see things through and 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 that's certainly true with uh, with Matt I think that. Uh, the biggest, the biggest thing, you know, with the approach, with the with swimming approach that we that we took was basically a, uh, a very, uh, a very uh, brute force uh, slash uh, constraint based uh, uh, swimming approach, where where basically we focused on him uh, doing a few things, uh, a few things well, and once. Uh, and once he was able to to do that, those then go to the next step. So, I uh, it was it was a, an approach that was based on uh, no drills, uh, intensive use of 
of toys and restrictions to 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 his swimming so basically you know if you can imagine when i when i when i say uh, restrictions to your swimming is let's let's work on just putting like the maximum amount of toys uh on on a swimmer so that the possibilities that he or she has to find the fastest way to swim are very are limited and uh and so you know some of the things that we used with matt was uh a lot of brute force a lot of like parachute paddles double pull buoy uh he never we never we never did like kicking you know matt never does drills never kicks with a kickboard so basically it was a little bit like an orthodox approach but uh but very very focused very focused on doing a f- only a few things uh uh right and uh and then and then just let you know the natural ability that the athlete has to just come come across come on top and and that's and that's the reason why you know matt was uh, last year racing under 23 worlds and coming out of the water two minutes and a half behind and uh and that that was olympic distance and and this year he's been having some pretty decent swims he was uh had a really good swim at uh Cagliari world cup he had a good swim uh at this race in Salinas, he also had some swims that were that were uh, very challenging for him. He didn't swim well enough on his first uh, World Cup without a wetsuit uh, in uh, in TZ. But uh, but yeah, he's progressing really well. But but I would say that the biggest deciding factor is obviously Matt's uh, commitment and uh, attitude and uh, and also the his natural ability to 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 be able to absorb the stimulus so well. So we've seen kind of quite a few, um, you might call talent transfer, uh, from, from running to, to triathlon in, in the women's, um, mm-hmm. particularly with sort of the post collegiate program in, in the U S. Um, why haven't, why do you think we haven't seen as many men, uh, like Matt come through, uh, compared to the women? Uh, I think that like time will tell what was the deciding factor in 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 this burst of talent that came through. You know, just to name just to name a few athletes, it's going to be quite a few athletes. You know, it's it's Quinn, it's uh, it's Katie, uh, it's Summer, it's Casper uh, and Tomlin, and uh, and uh, and those those are you know immediately like five top like top ten athletes and uh, and. Uh, and uh, and that's pretty pretty remarkable. I think time will tell if this was, you know, uh, a little bit of of a burst of talent that showed up at the at the at at this program, or if it, if it's it's something that can be sustained. Uh, I think that it comes down to my thoughts regarding this is like it comes down to this is just the condition of women in sport in the U.S is probably above anywhere else in the world. So there are more opportunities for women in sport in the US when compared to the rest of the world and even compared to the to the developed world. And uh, and and that trickles down into into everything. If you saw some uh, some numbers regarding the the US medals at uh, at the at the Olympics and through the years, it's more and more women are are winning medals for the U.S. and uh, and I think that reflects all stuff like Title IX and uh, and in collegiate sports and all and all that uh, and all that stuff. Uh, when it comes to the men, I think that uh, I think that there's there's you know I can only I can only speak for for the work that I have done where where uh, you know the men that I've that I've gotten. And and that I that I've coached also you know had a pretty good progression. So I don't know I don't I don't know what other coaches are doing, but uh, from my perspective from my perspective I've developed more men than women. So so I'm not I couldn't tell you what's going on in the program that more women are developed than men. I mean certainly the point about the Title IX and the, the amount of scholarships that are available to to not only U.S. women. I mean it's it's used internationally as well as a development system or opportunity. But yeah, that mm-hmm. is a special condition that you're likely going to have, you know, more women with 
uh, love, a level of talent that might be applicable to triathlon who are given the opportunity to pursue sport for a bit longer, perhaps, or, you know, in the right conditions that then they can uh, continue to be interested in pursuing that in post collegiate. So, you know, that, that is interesting because that's not even necessarily about the pr program, but however, also about the, the, uh, the talent pool available. But of course, then, yeah, you've, you've got to have the right conditions uh, to to find a, a place for those athletes and it, it's not an it's not an easy task and um you know uh, it, there's there's special conditions about how you can develop that and i think it'd be interesting to go deeper into that another time but um mm -hmm. i think we will roll into kind of the program stuff i mean a favorite topic of of ours i think is is looking at the organization of high performance sport about how you know how we do things how we run programs but also uh, at, at the highest levels of how how we how we organize you know on a, on a high level from federations to olympic committees etc i think it's really interesting to look at different models um and we saw an interesting article come out of um, new zealand where some of the athletes there were interviewed and talking about the level of funding that was going into it was really a relatively small uh, sporting country. New Zealand is, I mean, from a mm -hmm. population point of view, um, relative budget wise, and they're really quite focused on on a few sports. But basically, the art, the the headline that captured your your attention um, was uh, that there's 85 staff of of New Zealand's sport bodies that earn more than than a hundred thousand. Kiwi dollars and contrasting to if you're an Olympic gold medalist, then you, you get kind of up to 60,000 in grants and really putting the question, is this fair? Is this, you know, the, 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 the staff or the bureaucrats, if you like, are, you know, the many well-paid and relatively few athletes. Uh, and even when they're successful at the very highest levels are uh, relatively less not only rewarded, but I think it's, you know, because these grants are that the, typically the athletes receive are not, you know, they're not salary, they're, they're investments that typically are spent, you know, um, on, on programs on, etc. So, um, and the question is that fair and, and um, certainly gets you thinking about thinking how if a small country like New Zealand's got 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 85 uh, people earning more than a than 100 grand then uh, you know what what's going on here is this the right way to run a program and that's that's really what the the athletes were were asking uh in this article yeah I've, you know and 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 this is this is this is a theme that just like you know it's it's across sports and uh and uh and both in professional sports or also olympic sports but but one thing that's 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 interesting is 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 that uh, these like uh, heavily uh, controlled, I would say, uh, sports systems do have do have a, a, a really high number of people that are in management positions, and uh, and those people are are really far from making from making performance happen. You know, uh, it's just it's just. Sometimes I see I see some of these systems that where just management is is just there to justify themselves and what they do doesn't really like make a huge impact into into performance. Uh, you know, one one funny comment and uh, and this this article is going to be on the on the on the show notes. One funny argument it was that the the, the guy that's uh, that's in charge of everything, uh, I think he's he's a Canadian, right? Alex Bauman. Yeah, and, for, uh, former Olympic swimmer, Olympic medalist. Yeah, and uh, and he goes and says, "Oh, this is a problem of communication." And this is like, well, this is the guy that's making four hundred twenty thousand dollars a year, <laughs> and he's telling everyone else, and telling everyone else, and telling the athletes, "Now, this is a problem of communication." And and it reminds me, like when I hear that people say this is a problem of communication, I always think, uh, no. If you're telling me that's that's a problem of communication, that means that you're thinking that there wasn't enough bullshit uh, broadcasted in order to justify the the this this difference in uh, in in remuneration. You know, obviously, you know it's it. These are situations where it's uh, it cannot be justified that the athletes we which are you know which are the the sole purpose of why everything exists why shouldn't the athletes uh make the most money you know and and you see that uh, for bringing this back to 
uh, revenue sharing, for example, in in professional sports in the in the US, this is this is a big deal, and this is why this is why uh, sports in the have like the players are paid so much because why? Because that's where the revenue sharing is is going towards. We're like if there's a lot of money in the sport, then most of the money needs to go to the clowns, you know, to the athletes. It's kind of like, it's like they're the entertainers, they're the performers, they're the reason for things to exist. And it's, it's like, I, I think there's no justification for, for a system like, there are so many countries that have systems like this where what's emphasized is the management. For example, like Canada is a system like that where it's everything, everyone but the athletes is emphasized. Like the whole sporting culture is geared towards having management, physios, high performance directors, every single every single person of what they like to call the ISTs uh, are 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 involved and are getting paid, and the athletes are at at the end of the the line, and and this is simply. Uh, unacceptable because it's the athletes that are the performers. It's the athletes that are the reason for for everything to exist. And the athletes in in this in this article that that were interested in some of New Zealand's um, successful Olympians you're just basically questioning the the validity of this model and whether it it makes a difference. You know, and there's there's one quote about you know, uh, if it was more open and transparent in terms of the funding, uh, we'd come to the conclusion that they're doing a good job. Perhaps we would come to the conclusion that doing a good job. So even as you said, like, you know, there, a lot of these kind of positions, particularly, you know, uh, again, Alex Bauman making, uh, f- you know, 400 plus grand, they're very far from making a performance difference. And mm-hmm. and that's, that's part of the question. And I think a lot of countries are facing this same uh, indeed, Olympic sport as a whole, you could say, is 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 working on this same model in many countries where the management has taken this great importance um, over that of the ones that are getting the results and making the difference. And, you know, even the most successful Olympic athletes, uh, you know, there there's there's just not a you know, there's no guarantees. And, you know, one of the, you know, the athletes in here say you know, there's a big difference between being on a salary and these and these performance grants, because if you're on a performance grant, you know, you have one bad race, which is typically an Olympic sport, you know, it's the world champs or Olympic Games, and you can lose mm-hmm. the grant completely, where, of course, if you're on a salary uh, you know, despite the, the 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 final quote of this article, you know there there's not a direct link typically to uh, accountability for performance, and and that's ironically, Bauman says, um, you know, to the criticism, an athlete can see their performance grants drop dramatically due to one bad performance. He says you can't get away from performance accountability. Uh, sometimes it seems harsh, mm-hmm. but I'm a strong believer in that. And yet, you know, uh, the, these types of management are, are not typically directly accountable and they're very far mm-hmm. removed typically from, you know, if there's a, if there's a bad Olympic performance as a whole, um, you know, how much, how much, you know, accountability are these characters going to have? And we talked about, um, and, and linked to perhaps on Twitter, the, the rowing Canada stuff, you know, that can pretty much the disaster, uh-huh. the disaster that they had in, in, uh, Rio uh, changing their whole model to, you know, to kind of go for more medals by dismantling the, the very successful eight culture, the men's eight and trying to go into smaller boats, et cetera, et cetera. And it just didn't work. I mean, they, 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 they got fewer medals and, and generally I think there's wide agreement, not successful, and, mm-hmm. um, you know, and we'll see if the high powered management is going to take accountability for that. Uh, you know, in the short term, yeah, well, what we know is going to happen is the athletes grants are going to get cut. <laughs> so yep. you know, that's going to happen. But is there going to be accountability? I mean, to me, accountability in that case is the 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 the, the management that made the big call. They, they need to be out because they they failed in the the highest strategic level. And. Therefore, um, you know, I'm waiting to see resignations, but and I wouldn't hold my breath on that. Yeah, it was interesting in that article that uh, that uh, you see the high performance director throwing the coach under the bus 
where with his quotes, he says, well, I was supportive. I was supportive of the coach's decision, but it was his decision. So you just kind of like think like, well, this guy, first off, it's funny that like the people that are, that did were in charge of doing the, uh, doing the failing are the ones that are going to do the review, <laughs> which is, which is, you know, like, very, very few people involved in in sports are just going to do a review and then say like, and the conclusion of this review is that, that I should lose my job. You know, nobody's going to say that. So it's it's kind of like it looks like the system is rigged towards uh, those those managers that, uh, and even some some of those coaches where where uh, where they're not really accountable, and even when they're accountable. Just they lose they lose their jobs in uh, in one sport and uh, but they're still seen like oh this guy did a good job, you know by by management they they just look at it, it's like oh this guy as a high performance director did a good job at this federation it was the athlete that screwed it up and he just like gets another job with another federation and like you said in the meantime the athletes lost their grants some quit the sport because you know a sport like rowing. You either have funding and you're doing the sport, or you don't have funding and you just go on with your life, basically. And uh, and uh, and you know and and just there's just like destruction, you know. There's just like nothing was built, nothing nothing was gained, and it's just you know back to square zero or going going to square zero. Yeah, man. And the whole the whole point of this, you know, I think how we think about it, how I think about it is, is how does this relate to, you know, sort of the athlete coach working together and, and really advocating for real coaching, but, but really that, that athlete coach partnership is where uh, performance comes from. And a lot of this other stuff is, is, is not directly related to that. It can be supportive. It can help, but, it's got way out of hand in terms of the resources that are going into all this management, all this overhead, all these people that may or may not have really any substantial difference and, and, and really in most cases don't have a substantial difference and yet they take the vast majority of the resource and, and the athletes are, are often left really putting together their own teams or uh, you know, kind of advocating for their way that they know is successful, and and, and therefore sometimes they even opt they opt they must opt out of receiving some of the direct funding uh, as, as a result, and um, you know, and have to re- invest in themselves, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. However, it makes you question the the whole the whole system, and and this is happening in many places. This is not necessarily to pick on New Zealand, but you don't often see these kind of you know. I'd like to see how many. Uh, you know, UK sport uh, uh, staff members are paid, you know, above a certain threshold or, or in, in, in Sport Canada or USOC or, you know, go on and on. Um, and of course, bigger countries are going to have more more paid staff, but it does seem to got out of hand of what really makes successful programs. And, and we've talked about this before and it, it never will go out of style. But, you know, you, you get talented athletes working with talented coaches uh, and supported by a medical team and well funded you know keep them healthy train well progressing and uh, and you're going to get success and 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 that's the fundamentals and it just seems that the you know it's at it's just at the bottom of the priority that is just completely reversed in terms of where the investments are being made one thing that one thing that i see on on every on pretty much every document on high performance, on every press release, like a couple of weeks ago, I saw a press release come out, and it had this this uh, this buzz these buzzwords that that I actually believe in them, which is, and you've seen them hundreds of times, which is athlete centered, coach driven, right? And yep. you've okay, you've seen this millions of times. Yes. And here's here's and and this comes from quote unquote management, right? High performance directors, high performance managers, they come out and say like, we want a program that's athlete centered, coach driven. And and here's the deal, like for me as a coach, yes, that's what I want to see. And let's let's work to implement this. The problem is that athlete centered, coach driven is used as just jargon, pseudo bullshit that just is dropped because it looks really good, it looks really nice on a on a on a press release, and then it's not systematically not followed. 
followed. And and that's the the issue. It's just like if if every program was truly being athlete centered, coach driven, then uh, then every we would be if every every time and and this is and this is one of the questions on that on that New Zealand article where the athlete says uh, we need to ask the questions: Is this helping us perform? All those questions, right? Why are we doing this? Is this helping us perform? Uh, that, those sorts of questions. Uh, if we're answering those questions at every every step of the way, then uh, we will be uh, we will be better, you know. And you get dropped the athlete centered, coach driven, and then and then pretty much everything that uh, management comes up with is not coach driven because they come up with ideas that I didn't have. If I didn't have, then it's not being driven by the coach, you know. And uh, and uh, if you come up with ideas where the athletes have a bad response, don't engage, don't want to do it, then it's not athlete centered either. So so my recommendation here is every time you drop the athlete centered, coach driven, like you know, do me a favor and actually like live that every day and and let that principle pervade every decisions that you make, and then we'll be in a good place to perform. It's it's really interesting that that sport has kind of gotten to that place, at least particularly Olympic sport or or you know non professional sport, um, to this place where this phenomenon is so common. And yet, you know, if you get everyone into a room, and we, I'm sure that everyone would agree, is you know that sport should performance sport should not be administrative centered, administrative driven. You know, which, which is what it ends up feeling like and looking like a lot of the time. Um, you know, why could, why is that, you know? Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's kind of maybe perhaps a, a natural consequence of, of ever increasing funding. That's, you know, if you're successful, you get, you get more, but that's not necessarily on a needs basis and more money. A lot of the time, uh, creates more problems and more overhead, more bureaucracy and, you know, in, in government style, um, as is often criticized, it you know perhaps less efficient and and you know it can be detracting from performance you know and you know back back to the 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 rowing example and I probably used this one before I mean certainly we've talked about it but you know the 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 British coach rowing coach Mike Spracklin who uh, had had been to many different countries uh, uh, as the as a men's eight coach but in general uh, rowing coach and you know he'd often describe this this same pattern you know he'd be he started in a country without much really not much resources nothing and and they'd work very hard they they'd they you know do your do your job well every day get some success you know and then and then say win something let's say win olympic medal it he, he has gold medals i think olympic medals in in us canada and um great britain uh, so uh, serial success here and and so he'd be successful he'd then be given or his program or the the rowing federation given a bunch of money and then inevitably he said then the problems would start and mm-hmm. eventually the culture the environment that he created breaks down and uh, he ends up leaving the program and he goes to a new program that's desperate for success and starts again and uh, this, and then the same pattern follows itself, and 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 you know it's a very interesting thing. And then there's another example, um, touching another article touching on a, on a this this same concept really. And this was um, uh, by Ross Tucker of the Science of Sport uh, website, and it, it had to do with a, a South African athlete that was that was talking about. Um, uh, their experience in in the sport system really and and Ross commenting on that and uh uh-huh. you know and the, and the title being uh you know uh, on shit deflecting umbrellas high performance sport and uh and and this athlete and really just saying high performance sports systems should identify the best athletes then hire the best coaches and support staff and then protect that partnership from all the barriers challenges and obstacles in their way i e deflecting mm-hmm. the shit and mm-hmm. you know that you know it's, that concept immediately sort of resonates uh, in you know different words to say this, the same kind of things and yet uh we we don't often see that and when we don't often see those roles things get muddied and um and uh, and, and athletes and coaches get very frustrated with the reality uh-huh. yeah absolutely uh we 
as athletes and coaches are already getting a lot of shit under the umbrellas. We don't need <laughs> we don't need uh, more shit coming from the outside. Uh, but you know, I, I I think I think it comes down to 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 a lot of the times. A lot of the times, like you were just thinking about, you just made a comment about like government like, and uh, a lot of the times it comes it comes down to it go it comes down to to that where. Uh, you're involved in organizations that look like a lot like uh, like the movie the movie uh, the movie Office Space, you know, where the the boss of the main character uh, ca- keeps uh, asking him for the the cover sheet for the TPS reports, right? <laughs> and uh, and uh, and uh, how many times, Joel, as as a coach, you 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 received in the mail like like a, a requirement for you to start the season or start the quad and you just have to fill out the TPS report, you know, or ask the athlete to fill out TPS reports. It's just, uh, you just go, come to this, uh, you you just are confronted with situations where you see that uh, having a structure f- just for the sake of having a structure is more important than, uh, than focusing on the, on the key on the key aspects that define performance and the key aspects that define performance is first the athletes and then and then the athletes and how they interact co- with coaches and and what's the what's the environment that the that the relationship is is uh, in in it so so these are the main factors of of performance and uh, and we need to get away from from the the bureaucracy, the 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 Kafkian processes that uh, that athletes and coaches are involved on a on a on a worldwide, you know, like you, I make I make comments and you make comments and uh, and I'm sure that there's people out there listening and thinking like, oh, maybe this is this is about me or this is about my country or this is about my federation and uh, and as you know and you know better than me, just. Uh, these are issues that pervade, you know, like every country, every federation. You know, it's 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 a problem. <laughs> Indeed, you know, the, your comment about the um, the annual plans and and you know the sending the reports makes me think. Uh, uh, Stuart McMillan uh, is an athletic coach from Altus uh, Group in uh, mm-hmm. Scottsdale had a good had a good link. This guy posts quite a lot of good stuff. Uh, oddly enough, on his Instagram, <laughs> uh, underneath photos that he posts, there's a lot of good stuff under there. And he had a comment recently about sort of the the annual training plans or yearly training plans these atps or ytps that that typically we you know if you're if you're coaching a high performance athlete you're you're often asked to do uh, this type of thing and, I, and i've been a, a, as some of my roles in sort of management i've i've been there done that and asked for these things and and just how they have the relevance or usefulness of this type of planning tool as just kind of past it's just not that useful uh and there needs to be a new uh model for you know how you communicate needs how you communicate plans because a, a traditional ytp plan it doesn't it doesn't communicate effectively what your what what the point is of like well okay what do we need what what resources do we need for to to move the athlete's performance on to prepare the best possible to make you know the best environment it, it doesn't answer that question and often when we have these these meetings with sort of the administration and management and you know and I echo what you said about I mean this is a universal trend it's not of any particular place it's a you know, symptom of i think olympic sport and olympic sport management is you know requesting these types of plans and you know and, and Stu basically you know says it's kind of a make work project because it typically doesn't it's not meaningful for the coach and if it's not meaningful for the coach and athlete then then you know why are they being asked to produce it and uh, mm-hmm. i think a, a new paradigm is is needed there about how how does this how, how you know how how do you create these uh, shit deflecting umbrellas? What how do you communicate what the needs are uh, for athletes in a meaningful way that results in action? You know, it's one thing to you know, I mean, you can ask for what you want and it be denied, but um, you know, which which happens. You know, you can say, well, I want to, I want to, you know, different different levels of support, or you know, I need. Uh, I need some help with a particular technical area or something like that and, you know, can be just simply denied because lack of resources, but there's got to be a better way to do this. 
Uh, I just have to chastise you for using the word paradigm. I think that the new paradigm would be a game changer as we we prepare the, the Olympiads of uh, 2028. We need to have another bullshit bingo episode, do we? <laughs> That's right. Words mean things. High performance, excellence, world class. Right. So enough on the, the high performance for today. So we'll put the links to those. I think it's even if you're running kind of your own, you know, program, perhaps it's not related necessarily directly to elite performance. I think there's always something to be le- learned, uh, as we said in the outset of this of this segment about, you know, how we're how we're looking at our own programs. How do we build the best support, whether it's club level or, or otherwise? Um and so, uh, yeah, then we move on to a, a bit on training. And one of the things that you and I were talking about um, before was was kind of run training. And we'll, I think we'll kind of go in deeper into this later in the in the autumn here. Um, but uh, this concept of sort of key workouts and particularly key, key workouts in, in run training um, and the relative importance of what sessions you're doing uh balanced across some bike run but but equally you know uh, the specifics of the sessions so expand on on your thoughts on this one about about this topic of, of how do we how do we program run sessions and how important are the specific sessions we're doing uh yeah uh you know this this comes down to 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 s- some stuff that we discussed before uh regarding like basically like the expression or similar expressions to key workouts and uh and uh and uh, and basically uh everyone everyone is really interested in always knowing what are the key workouts uh and uh and most of the time the key workouts just represent um uh, just represent you know at most what 20 30 percent of uh 30 percent of of what you're doing and uh and and most of the times like the other step that you're doing the 70 percent is not even talked about and uh and uh and you know through the years and i'm i don't know but i think that's your experience as well is is the more the more i focus on what the the more i focus on not the key workouts, but just like the 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 the, the program overall. Uh, you know, I think the better results I I get. A lot of the times we get too caught up in in thinking that uh, you know if I did uh, if I did uh, ten or twelve times four hundred on the track one week, then then I have to do five hundred or six hundred the next week, and or if we did this volume, then the next week we got to improve. We got to increase eight percent or five percent or 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 something like that and uh and I think I've had a lot more success in just seeing you know particularly the run the run training as more like as a whole and how how the the key workouts or faster workouts are going to be less important in the big picture and uh and certainly. How the load that the perceived training load that we're going to have from these workouts is going to be a smaller drop in the in in the lake than uh, than 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 an approach where you just think about how the workouts the key workouts are the most important thing and then you just you just run around them. So so all this to say that that my approach through the years has has focused more on definitely less volume in the faster stuff that we do and also looking more uh at the program as a whole on like every session being important the load of every session being important and uh and uh, and and factors like how can we create a sustainable program are more important than just uh looking for progressions or looking for if I did this workout in one week, what's the right workout to do the next week? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The the whole the sustainability, I think, is is one that point that resonates with me in terms of like what can you do that you can keep doing that, especially in triathlon, that you know you've got to you've got to be able to swim the next day after a run session. You've got to be able to do your key rides. You've got to be able to do all all them together. And and uh, you know, there's such a tendency to overdo run sessions, and I mean, particularly with the risk of injury 
being you know higher in 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 running sessions than than swimming or riding that you know it's so easy to to overdo it and you know i think when you and even you know obsessed then with the specifics of as you say what progression should you use what the session should be of course it's very interesting uh, we all like to look at different you know sessions or work sessions however it's very easy to miss the point of what uh what the stimulus you're after is and how to how to program sessions so you get the right the right stimulus the right the response that you're looking for what what's you know i think this is particularly where this concept of minimal effective dose is is interesting to think about uh, what is the minimal dose to get the response you you want um and um and how important is in sort of variety in terms of that in ter- in terms of the the types of sessions you know should they should they vary a lot is is you know is it is it for the for the brain that you do that is it for the body stimulus for the physiology mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. all of that and you know in, in practice you know i've ended up sort of repeating quite a lot of the same sessions the last uh, few years and even the same sessions um, through the year. So we typically do a build up of sessions prior to first racing, uh, the beginning of the season, you know, whether that be, you know, in the world series circuit or, or, um, world cups or, or even 70.3 races, we do a progression of build up of particular style of workouts. And then, uh, if we can, according to the season plan, perhaps we do a sort of a double periodization or a, a second build up. We often use the same sessions, um and mm-hmm. uh and and that's um uh not necessarily looking for a variety there um but but I, you know it, it, they're the same we're looking for a particular response from it rather than necessarily n- always needing to progress i think it's a an easy mistake to get drawn into is like well, always my workouts need to be getting harder and faster and mm-hmm. and, and more and more and more and i think that's just a, a road to to injury and, and illness and, and not being consistent. And, you know, I think particularly when as athletes um, either reach some sort of performance plateau or they mature in their development, you know, the, the subtleties of improvement are, are not, well, they're subtle. <laughs> you don't see huge improvements anymore uh, in sessions and, and you needn't try to chase them. And I think that's, you know, kind of another point of like, you know, if you're doing the classic, you know, 1K reps, you know, they don't always need to get faster and faster, you know, even year on year or through the season. I mean, you know, you can change the rest, you can, you know, run at a level that gives you the right uh, response, but not more than that, you know, um, you don't necessarily get more uh, by by pushing harder. And, you know, I've got, we've got kind of internal expression about, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to um, use up all our bullets you know, if you think you've got so many bullets in a year, you know, don't don't spend them all or fire them all in, in, in your training sessions and, and organize, uh-huh. organize your training accordingly. Because, you know, if there's a systematic mistake we see uh, or a, a performance disconnect, you know, it's athletes that perform very well in training sessions, run training sessions in particular. Uh, and yet when they come to the races, they're, they're not performing well and wondering why. And I think one of the mm-hmm. aspects is, is spending those bullets in, in training, and, which obviously just really means uh, training at too high of an intensity uh, for too long. And, and then therefore, you know, uh, compromising their overall t- training load and consistency over time at, in a level that's not sustainable. Uh, and, you know, and I think that, you know, that, so that's an interesting point. And you talked previously uh, about sort of a healthy training load. And, and I think that sort of captures that, doesn't it? Yeah. Achieving that healthy training load is, it's, uh, it's, uh, so hard, you know, and, uh, and a lot of the times when, 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 when the discussion that I was having with one of my athletes the other day was how, how, uh, we were talking about how a lot of the times, uh, you know, the injuries that he had or the setbacks that he had, he felt that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't the question of the overall load that he was carrying, but also the, the, how, how fast he built back up from, from a low, from a low, uh, from a low level. For example, we've had, we've had situations where he had, uh, he had, uh, injuries and, uh, and not coming from a lot of load. But coming from, for example, a period where he's uh, racing two or three weeks in a row, and then he comes back and uh, 
and we just get back to load. It's not like, you know, it's not like we're running like 100K weeks, uh, you know, the, the, the following week from this period. But but basically, and and the, and the joke was just like, it was, it's, it wasn't the value of the function, it was the derivative of the function, or, or to say it in another way, it was, it was not the velocity, it was the acceleration. Basically, basically, it's not, we, you can, you can uh, drive very fast, so your velocity is high, but as long as you accelerate very slowly, so that it takes a long time for you to get to that, uh, to that, uh, to that load, and uh, and uh, and that's that's I think that's a concept that has a uh, has some uh, some uh, some value to it because uh, because I've seen many situations where I had athletes that were uh, that were uh, injured coming out of not a lot of load in in situations or injuries that uh, injuries that um, that seemed to that seemed to be you know normally associated with load like stress fractures but uh but that they were not coming from from a period of load and and uh and you know there's some research right now where where uh you analyze the you analyze the um, the ratio between uh acute training load and uh the ratio between acute training load and chronic training load and uh and uh and there's actually a paper that uh that attributed higher risk of injury in rugby players if they had uh, uh, an acute uh, uh, that ratio uh, from 1.5 to 2. So meaning that uh, the acute training load was 1.5 to 2 times higher than the the chronic training load. And I think that uh, that I think that that's got a lot of value in uh, in in making that analysis. I've started tracking. Uh, Acute uh, over chronic training load, and definitely one thing that I one thing that I've noticed is like the program, the program that I prescribe to most athletes ends up being rel- really safe in the sense that uh, we're definitely like always under like 1.5, but uh, but at the same time I've had athletes uh, getting injured, particularly on the run, uh, at at uh, with that ratio like around like 1.3, 1.4, so. It makes me think like either this is obviously this is not like the whole picture, but at the same time, uh, at the same time, makes me think that uh, uh, you know maybe triathletes are not rugby players, or maybe maybe injury or the risk of injury uh, happens uh, more associated with uh, with lower ratios or or keeping a lower ratio up for uh, for for a long time. So so definitely. Definitely, the question of healthy training load is something that uh, that is uh, there's absolutely central to um, to to performance in running. Yeah, I mean, it's something we the concept that we, we talk about a lot, and uh, you know, it's in the endurance world is you know consistency. And okay, everyone agrees that's important. It becomes sort of jargon, but it's like, well, how do you do that? And that's kind of what you're mm-hmm. what you're getting at there. So, how do you be consistent? How, how do you balance the you know frequency, intensity, duration, and and ramp rate uh, up and down? You know, um, mm-hmm. um, and 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 you know, come back to the original point of you know. Uh, you know how important are those are those main sessions or is it really primarily the theme that's important and how you manage them and what you do with the other 70 80 percent of of your running that's going to lead to successful and consistent fast mm-hmm. running yeah another another point that that came up that's really related to the the injury and health side of things that it could be uh it's often thought of but but perhaps that's open for debate and and we've talked about it before but it's coming back to the the whole sort of strength and conditioning question and whether that is uh, related to keeping athletes injury free uh whether we use sort of mobility techniques or uh, you know activities such as yoga and pilates what is your current practice uh in regards to this Paul? uh i like to i like to see my athletes as the control group <laughs> so and that's that's been my that's been my position uh, for a long time which means that uh, while everybody does something if we don't do anything we're the control group and then uh, in the end uh, 
in the end we'll uh, we'll compare results and uh, and see who who's, who's, who got uh, who had who had better results. Obviously, uh, one thing like you know some observations that I see is that it it does seem that uh, athletes that are uh, quote unquote injury prone they do seem to do a lot of uh, a lot of uh, strengthening conditioning. Uh, kind of stuff, and I always, I'm always thinking that uh, that uh, you know, I, I've I've yet to see an athlete that uh, that uh, was injury prone and then starts doing a lot of uh, strength and conditioning stuff, and uh, and then uh, and then uh, and then stops being injury prone. Most of the times, uh, athletes that are injury prone through these. Uh, uh, strength and conditioning uh, techniques, they usually stay injury prone. And, and that's something that, you know, it's an observation that, that I've made, like with, you know, observing many athletes. And it's, it's interesting that, uh, you know, with social media, there's more information about that. I think that uh, athletes like to uh, tweet Instagram their, uh, their lunges or their, uh, or their uh, exercises with a Swiss ball. Oh wait, no, sw- there's no Swiss ball anymore. Swiss ball was a few years ago. It's gone now. And uh, so, or yoga. Yoga, I think it's a, a little bit on the downside of popularity. Uh, and uh, it's probably going to disappear in a few years. And uh, I think that, like right now, like uh, CrossFit kind of stuff is is what's uh, what's in fashion for uh, for strength and conditioning crap. And uh, oh, did I say crap? I I meant methods. And um, and uh, you know, it's it's one of those things where here's what I do. Obviously, it's we use physio a bunch. Uh, I think the key the key with uh, with physical therapy is find somebody that's a really good practitioner, and a lot of the times, a good practitioner for. Uh, for for a specific athlete doesn't work for other athletes i got i have examples of that and and that's i think that's that's fine uh i i i think that a lot of times obviously for injury rehab it's going to be really helpful i'm not a big fan of doing a lot of exercises or routines for what you would call like prehab or just like to prevent injuries i think that the way to prevent injuries is is avoid it's just avoid training mistakes and and so i would say that that most of the times i am the biggest uh i am uh i'm the person responsible for injuring my athletes because i'm in charge of their training loads and uh and uh, and if they get injured then uh, then mo- i believe that most of the times it's going to be a problem that we something we did wrong uh with with training load so so on the side of uh Injury prevention. I'm definitely on the side, like the comments that I made earlier. Definitely on the side of how can we uh, have uh, a level of training load and the training methods that we're applying to this particular athlete. How can we uh, tailor that to to a specific athlete so that uh, so that we can achieve that uh, that healthy training load. Yeah, and I, I was on uh, uh, another podcast called the Physio Matters podcast, where I talked a little bit about this, and and um, with uh, Physio Paul Westwood that that we've um, worked with before in the squad, and and also just general the comments um, about really training load is what injures athletes uh, and uh, too much, and sometimes they have uh, biomechanical limitations that might lower the training load that they can tolerate but ultimately it's loading that causes tissues to fail which is what injuries are uh so we're in control of that as as coaches or we we ought to be and um well there's some evidence of of you know gym and strength work can positively impact endurance performance uh it's not so simple as simply you know adding uh you know heavy weights or different different strength type protocols to uh to an overall program and and then uh, everyone's faster or better or injury free it's it's more more uh, nuanced than that and and often when we see the addition of this stuff i mean uh, inevitably i've seen so many times of of the the intended activity to get stronger or f- further injury free ends up causing uh, unintended consequences or problems 
uh, that we end up dealing with that that mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. that can be can be um, very detrimental and, and entirely uh, avoidable um, as well. So you know, it, it's what the best way to avoid injuring athletes is to carefully manage training load and, and to pay attention to how they're coping, uh, and um, and that's within reach of, of all coaches. So yeah, I put the link to that that. Uh, physio matters podcast and um uh, have a listen there uh, when i expand further on this but in terms of current practice of strength and conditioning it's you know, describe it as as you know fairly uh, modest um and uh, maybe not the entire uh, control group but certainly not on the the uh, extensive side uh, that that i've seen uh, it's 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 really perhaps some specific stuff to individual athletes and, and very modest loading in that way. And then primarily via training load uh, modification mm-hmm. and, and management. And, and again, that's a, you know, a good message if you're, you know, for a, a independent coach or without a big budget of sending athletes to physios and massage, et cetera, is that, you know, a lot of, most of this is under our own control. And, and uh, if we uh, do a good job and avoid making training load errors, then we're, we're likely to have consistent, consistent uh healthy athletes yeah i mean it's 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 i'm not going to deny and and i don't deny in my in my daily practice i i don't deny that that physical therapy is uh is helpful in uh in uh in uh you know keeping athletes healthy and training at at a at a level that was not possible if we didn't have physical therapy to just address you know small issues prevent uh, small issues from becoming bigger, et cetera, et cetera. But, but at the same time, um, one thing that, that I even, I tell my athletes and, uh, and that I, I definitely want to, uh, get away from is, and I see that, I see that from, from a few coaches, uh, the concept that, uh, uh, I break them and then the physio puts them back together, you know? Um, so because that's most of the times, uh, that's not going to be a, a converging process. What's going, what's the end process of, 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 or the end, uh, the end, uh, game of, of that kind of process is I break them and they're broken, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they're going to take a long time until you can fix them again, you know, and, uh, and definitely, and a lot of times sending out that message where, for example, like, and I've had this at these athletes where, where, for example, they think like, oh, I have to have like, t- physical therapy every week to just keep me rolling. And, and I, I just tell them like, uh, that's, that's not going to be good. That's not going to be a good, that's not going to be a good outcome. If we're doing something wrong, if every week you're going to need therapy, you know? Uh, so I definitely want to, I want to, to see physical therapy as a resource that we use kind of like when we go off the rails a little bit, and sometimes there's some situations that that need to be managed with the help of physical therapy for specific athletes. But I don't like to have like a one size fits all approach where everybody goes to the physio every every week, two times a week. Oh, uh, I have that physio is the guy that puts me back together because I'm always broken. That's that. I don't think that's a that's a, a very uh, healthy approach to the to the to the subject of uh, of uh, being uh, injury of uh, of injury prevention i mean absolutely and 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 frankly physios just don't have the ability to put athletes back together that we overload i mean the profession has got limitations in terms of what they can actually do in terms of tissue manipulation and and you know, uh, pushing blood around and manipulating blood flow, etc. I mean, there, there's some evidence of what the physio profession can do. And again, I talk about this in the Physio Matters podcast, but uh, they're not able to just fix athletes so simply. Uh, and and it takes time. And, you know, the 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 axiom the the best uh, uh, predictor of future injuries are past injuries and the mm-hmm. best way to avoid uh, 
being injured in the first place is to avoid overloading the athletes. So I think, you know, I mean, it comes back to the importance of, of coaching and, and good practice to, to avoid the, these patterns of overload that can be very difficult to get out of. So much easier in, in, in the beginning to, um, to have good practice and, and sen sensible, uh, coaching, real coaching and, uh, uh, and, and really, you know, kind of keeping the ego in check, I think, with loading. I think that's if there's anything that's, you know, a, a, a continual takeaway. And it's one that you, as, as a coach, you know, it, it's you, you always have to remind yourself of that, because particularly when you're, you're trying to you're work in an environment of getting better, uh, always trying to improve, always trying to uh, progress from where you're at and um you know it's very tempting to to just want to ramp it up all the time but if there's anything that uh you know certainly i've learned and, and tried to put in practice is is keeping the brakes on keeping the reins on a lot of the time is the right decision most of the time um mm -hmm. you know when we mm -hmm. deal with highly motivated athletes they they uh they, they they're they're going faster anyway they want to go faster they want to push more they want to do more and, and we've got to to sort of see past that and, and not, you know, our, our process as coaches is, is got to be about what's best for the athlete and not us trying to gain confidence from the athlete doing amazing training loads. That's not the point. The mm -hmm. point is to perform in races. Yeah. I, you know, just to pick up on one thing that you just said and, uh, and something that, that I found and, and, and something that I found rather recently, which is, you know, I, I, I used to, encourage my athletes to just push harder more in training particularly like in harder sets and uh and i kind of like backed away a little bit from that and uh and the biggest reason uh since my caffeine levels are the same <laughs> the biggest reason for that is that uh is that I, I i found that a lot of the times particularly with running uh i would push athletes to to just go to into their reserve the kind of reserve that you should go only when you're racing, you know, and sometimes I would push them into that reserve and we would have like a really great session. And, uh, and then, and then in the next few days, I would kind of like get like the, the, you know, the hangover of that session, you know, which is either, either a niggle or an injury or the athlete not being able to back it up from day to day or, or in even two or three days. And, uh, and definitely like my my attitude my attitude with uh, with athletes particularly like the faster we go is just to let them express themselves uh and express what they're able to to do on the day because a lot of the times athletes are they want to go fast they want to go hard that's what they want to do you know i for just to give you an example this morning i had a i had a couple of different uh sessions in the run with two different groups and uh you that's uh if you want to go into my instagram ps triathlon and you can see them <laughs> and uh and uh and and my interaction with with the athletes during the session was was just minimum it was just like they were we were running fast for a little bit uh one session was w one session was really where i just left to the athletes the to decide their uh their uh the rest interval and and mainly i just observed and uh and and run the session and i wasn't like didn't know what time they made they did uh it was a point to point to repeat so i had i either knew when they were left or when they arrived and uh and and at the end i was really happy with the session because in the end it was just like hey these guys don't need like me to just like okay let's go target time for this repeat is this time let's push let's go faster half a second because a lot of times without knowing or we just like are pushing the athletes it's just like they are already really good at knowing what it means to go beyond their comfort zone and a lot of times having a coach there to quote unquote motivate them is the is the factor that's going to put them over the over the edge and uh and uh and then you know like i said the hangover of of one of those sessions might last for for days or even sometimes weeks. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I th <laughs> the interesting that, you know, the job of the coach in, in most cases, as you say, is the opposite of the motivating coach. You don't, don't actually need that. Um, athletes that have decided to, 
you know, work with a coach and work in an environment where they're at a coach session. I mean, probably have self-selected already to be a, a motivated type. So they, they've, they've passed that uh, hurdle and, and, and really they're more likely to need someone to, you know, be the voice of uh, reason or observation of seeing, you know, that that's enough or, or, you know, to stick to the plan even. And I, I don't know how many times where, you know, we primarily, the way I primarily run sessions is run sessions, uh, perform running sessions, uh, coach running sessions is, is by mm -hmm. prescribed, um, paces, meaning that it's not just, you know, uh, go as hard, hard as you can go or as, you know, run, you know, we often will prescribe a pace and then we run to that pace and we're disciplined about that. And it's a pace that we, uh, we think is doable. And, um, and uh, usually what I want, if the athletes are going faster than that, I'm telling them to slow down, not, not um, telling them, hey, great job, you're going so fast, this is amazing, because uh, that's usually when things are going to go wrong, is when you're exceeding yes. what you know roughly the physiolog physiological capabilities are, um, you know, uh, uh, let's save that, save that expression of that for racing uh we don't need to mm -hmm. see that because we know we're going to get a good stimulus if if we've if we've done our homework and we've prepared well and we know the physiology we're dealing with we know roughly the range of of uh speeds and conditions um uh in the given conditions that that will elicit the response we're after so we we're disciplined about that and you know um and we don't need to motivate them to go faster or or get caught up in in, in how fantastic running sessions can be when uh when when again those are often the ones that um you regret later uh-huh uh -huh. So on that point, we, sh we should wrap. And um, the next time we talk will be the post Kona analysis and, uh, and, and uh, maybe looking into our, our winter planning and, and training topics. Uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Uh, hopefully my, uh, my day of uh, Kona watching this year is going to last a little bit longer than last year. And, uh, and yeah, so uh, I guess I'll, uh, I'll talk to you next week. Until then.